thank you very much indeed. It's a delight to be here as we were talking in the break. It's uh, an unusual set of circumstances that's led to all these online things, but it means that me, who is uh, up here in, uh, in Chicago, uh, can join with you guys. So this is fantastic. So this is um, a talk, a sort of a version of a talk that I've given, as I was saying uh, to other folks um, before, a couple of times to people who don't know what a BBC Microwave is. So on this crowd, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining that because you already know. But um, uh, I, I have this slide here where I go from the, uh, the rather sort of traditional slide to a BBC-ish font. And when I first did this, it was to sort of show the fact that we were moving to a, uh, a sort of more retro, let's retro this up is kind of the line I used. And it occurred to me only this morning that really I should have spent some time to write a BBC Micro presentation software and do the whole presentation using the emulator. But I'm so unfortunately, this is all you're going to get. So a quick thing or two about who I am. Uh, I am... I'm Matt Gobble. I have been in the US for 10 years, um, but obviously I'm British. I grew up with the BBC as kind of my, one of my two default um, computers. I had a Spectrum actually as my first computer, who, or cheer, I don't know. I don't want to fan any flames. Um, I really enjoyed the Spectrum, but um, the, the BBC Master was the, the thing that I really cut my teeth on. And really I learned to program, and I'm a professional programmer now, I learned to program use, from typing in uh, magazine listings. So, um, oh, hang on a second, I've got this all out of order. Ha, huh. well, I'm more well known these days for some other website that I do called Compiler Explorer, uh, which we can look up if you're interested in, but that's where I spend the majority of my hobby time, sadly. But why did I choose the Beeb um, for, for, um, to, uh, as my sort of main computer? Well, as I said, I'm a professional programmer and I learned to program by typing in magazine listings such as this, you know, this is the, uh, uh, a, a, uh, star info catalog um, section which I'm sure a lot of us used to thumb through when when we went to the news agents and buy our uh, Acorn users and in fact myself and Rich Talbot Watkins who um, I went to school with we we met on the first day of school and we've been firm friends ever since we um, we actually wrote some of these things so that was kind of my first paid programming job was getting the 10 pounds and 50 pounds uh, from from submitting things to Star Info, and in fact, towards the end of Acorn News's covering of the BBC, Rich and I had written a game, and we were in negotiation about serializing it in I think five parts. So that, but unfortunately, the Acorn News um, folks decided that they, there was no need to be covering the BBC anymore. It was gone, and they moved fully towards the Archimedes, which was a shame. But it would have been an interesting world if we had been maybe a little bit earlier. So JSB obviously is uh, an emulator that I think most of you have seen or know about, but why on earth did it come about? And I mean, really the, the short answer to this is, is because it's cool, right? I mean, how amazing is it to be able to actually point people at a web browser, uh, at a URL and, and relive your childhood? Um, I kind of just wanted to show that it could be done. And I, I'll be honest with you, this is not the first emulator I've written in JavaScript, which is the, the language that the web page will run in. Uh, I had written a, a version, I guess this is, there's an interesting story here. Uh, Rich and I, mostly Rich, worked on a Sega Master System emulator. So we were discussing in the break about um, an unreleased game called Blurb that Rich has done, which is itself a version of an Archimedes game, which is itself a version of a Sega Master System game that I had on my Sega Master System growing up. And that... Um, we had written an emulator on the Acor, uh, sorry, on the Archimedes for the Sega Master System called Miracle. And it was all in assembly. And Rich now, he, he wrote up a document explaining how the Sega Master System worked. And it is now considered like the go-to document if you want to know how the Master System works, which is crazy. Still circulating out there on the internet. Um, and so anyway, many years later on, when we'd first moved over to the US, my wife and family had to go back to the UK for a, a, a while and left me home alone. And I decided that I would prove to myself how crappy this web technology was by showing that it's can't, you couldn't possibly do an emulator in a browser. And it turned out that you can, you can do very well. So I wrote a Sega Master System uh, emulator. And then a few years later, I'm like, well, I don't really care that much about the Sega Master System. There's one game that I love on the Sega Master System, which is Wonder Boy 3, and you should all go and play. But everything else doesn't really mean as much to me as the BBC Micro. So why not turn my attention to the BBC Micro? Sorry, slight off-screen off issues going on here. So JSB was born 
Um, it lives at bbc.godvault.org and it obviously powers bbcmicro.co.uk, which I think is where most of you probably um, uh, see it and, and use it. And um, before I launch into some of the, like how it works and how emulators work in general, Kieran suggested that, uh, as many of you probably are already aware of how a lot of this stuff works behind the scenes, that I should actually do like a usability um, aspect, uh, show some of the usability aspects of JSB. And so I need to get out of full screen mode here and I'm going to actually try and do some live stuff, which is always scary. So I'm just going to go to bbc.gobble.org and hopefully you can all see this still. And I, I wonder if, if you could put it in the chat, can you hear the beep that it makes? I'm not sure that the sound works on my, my setup. I don't know that that's important because I think you all know what a BBC micro sounds like, but obviously here's JS Beeb. Um, you didn't hear it. Okay. Thank you. Um, never mind. I don't think we need to worry too much about that. And I'm certainly not going to try and play around with Linux audio settings live. That's too scary. So, um, here it is. You've obviously um, seen the, the cub monitor and everything, which is kind of a neat, cute thing, but maybe not to everyone's taste. First thing I'd show is that if you really just want to have that full screen immersive experience, if you go into full screen mode, you get kind of a more traditional emulator view where there isn't the outside um, uh, fluff around and you can just get to see a BBC micro. So that's kind of a nice thing. I sometimes project this onto my big telly using Chromecast to sort of run on the, on the, on the big screen. Uh, there are um, other options up here. You've probably all used these before, but it's worth mentioning in case you haven't. You can load things directly from the Stairway to Hell archive. So this lets you search randomly. So if you want to pick up Repton, you can go get Repton like this. And it incidentally also updates the URL at the top with the URL that would bring you back to this point. Um, another thing worth saying is that you can tick an auto boot here. And it also adjusts so that it will just boot into that game. So if you were to actually get, share this URL with somebody else, they would immediately get Repton and it would you know, shift break into, into the game. Uh, another thing that's kind of useful, if I do you know, star dot here, sometimes you want to get the text output and it's annoying. You can't like select text here and control C and control V into something else. But what you can do is a sort of stop gap. And this is Chris's awesome uh, scary beast, Chris, awesome contribution is if you hit control B, it brings up a fake printer. So control B is the, con the control code to send everything to the printer. And we actually have a printer, which is just another window. Um, I don't know, let me just start off again. Unfortunately, it pops to the behind. You can see that now um, the output of whatever I was um, redirecting to the printer ends up in this regular um, view, which is just re you know, text. So I can you know, copy paste things. I can take the word repton. I can, oh, apparently it should be lepton or repton. How funny copy that and then the other side of that is that it's possible for you to paste back into the emulator by pasting into this text box up here so i'm just going to hit control v on my side and you can see that it typed in repton so that's pretty neat um, actually earlier while i was testing this and, and running through uh, this sort of presentation i stole the url up here and pasted it in and, and uh, obviously it pasted the url in which is of course no use and then it reminded me so i used to work at google and i sp i actually had my bbc at the office in Google London. And I think, I think I'm probably the only person who has ever done a full Google search on a BBC computer. Cause we, we, I cobbled together a, a serial cable and slaved it to a, a terminal emulator on my main machine and ran like a, a curl from that and pasted the results back to, to the Beeb. And so I actually did get the Google homepage up live. And I mean, certainly maybe other people have done this before, but I'm the only one to have done it, I think, within Google itself. So anyway, that was just a funny little anecdote. So control B. Uh, yes, I'm looking at my notes over here. Um, so we've got Repton running here. Obviously, full screen is useful if you're going to go and play some things. Uh, some other sort of useful key presses here. If you want to take a screenshot, let me just start running Repton. I'm going to, oops, sorry, not. I recently have switched keyboard and my keyboard doesn't actually have any function keys. I have to press chords to get them. So if you see me floundering, it's because of that. So here's everyone's favorite Repton. Oh, and I'm getting the refrain of it playing in my ears at extremely loud. So you're probably glad you can't hear it. Um, if you want to screenshot it, you can hit control end and now it's paused. And so um, obviously you can't tell because the music, the music has stopped playing, thankfully for me. And now you can screenshot this without any kind of extra stuff on the top. That's kind of a useful thing. G will restart it. Now, maybe many of you have seen the, what you get if you press control home. 
So control home brings up the debugger. And I think anybody who's written an emulator, the most valuable, the most well-spent time you can, you can spend is, is to write a decent debugger because you're going to be spending a whole bunch of time debugging other people's code, other people's games without any source code for it. So it's a, worth having all of the things available to you. Uh, obviously, you can see we have the system VIA, the user VIA here. Um, I can scroll through the memory here. I'm just using the mouse wheel to go through the memory, but I can type in addresses up here. There's a disassembly view and the registers um, over on this side. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer because so I'll start highlighting areas to show you where I mean. So yeah, you can see the scan line someone's just put. That's, that's kind of a, an interesting feature. So N is the single step to go to next instruction. And as I'm doing it, you may see that there's this white dot moving across the screen, painting as it goes. It's a sort of very cheap and cheerful, cheesy representation of the where the, the CRTC beam is. And it's not 100% accurate. The, the eagle-eyed among you might see that occasionally, like there, this red part here has, has appeared a little bit ahead of where the dot is. But it's a representation of where it is. And, as of um, a recent change we made, you don't see the old picture below. That's a sort of OpenGL optimization. So you can, you can you know, single step through, um, and that's a useful thing to be able to do. Uh, you can do breakpoints. So if I go to like FFEE over here, and I click in the old margin, just like an IDE, I've set a breakpoint on FFEE, and then obviously it's not gonna do anything with it. Let me escape. Yes, so I hit escape. And we've immediately hit this breakpoint over here. Uh, and, and now I can see that obviously the FFFE, it goes indirect to um, uh, uh, via 2OE of the, the vector at 2OE. The disassembler here has actually looked at where that would go and told me that it'll go to EOA4. And the fact that this is blue means that it's clickable. So I can actually click on it and see where uh, we go. And then I can hit B to go back to where I was before. There's like a stack of disassembly, just like a, any sem semi-decent disassembly. Uh, view. Now, um, there are some other key presses as well. Um, I can move, move around inside here. Um, it's probably best to, for, for time's sake to, to point you. There's a wiki, wiki uh, that has a bunch of, uh, of, of details on some of the like key presses, which can, can be useful. But the more interesting, um, powerful things. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let, let's see. So you can step in and step out. If I hit N, it will go into that routine. If I hit M, it will step over it. It won't go into it. And then similarly, if I step into this routine, now I'm inside you know, the uh, Oz routine, um, I can hit O to come back out again. So I should hit O and you can see that we've returned back for where that JSR was. And that can be a really useful thing, obviously, if, uh, um, if you're trying to say, why, how old do we get to this point? But more useful than that, and, and a lot of the more powerful features for, for de debugging aren't actually, they don't have a UI component to them. So now I'm going to hit Control Shift J, which brings up the browser's console. I've got it set to be on the right hand side over here. And you can see all this guff up here. You don't have to worry what this is doing. But now I can actually introspect the code of JSB while it's running. And there are a whole bunch of useful, I think, routines and functions and functionality that you can get access to from this JavaScript console. So the main object I can get access to is the processor. And so I can just hit enter on the processor and you can see that the, 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 um, the debugger uh, for JavaScript has printed out what this processor is. And I can see the stack pointer, the Y, the X and the A registers. And then there is dozens and dozens of other things. So I don't know if, you, um, if you're the kind of programmer like me, I basically use autocomplete to remind me what the heck's going on. We were talking earlier about remembering things and I definitely can never remember anything, but I can tell you that if you do processor dot and then debug, you get to see all the things that I've written that are for, for debug purposes or the main ones. So JavaScript um, tends to push you towards like an event model. And I've chosen to uh, represent that also inside of the emulator. So anytime an instruction is run, anytime memory is read from or, any, or written to, an event happens and I can hook into that. And um, I can optionally, as a result of that event happening, go into the debugger. So for example, this debug read here has a method called add. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a handler, a new handler to the list of things that get called every single time a read happens inside the emulator. And what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna return true if the read address was E00. So I'm basically gonna put a memory read breakpoint on E00. Now, one way in JavaScript to do that is to write a function like this, 
we take an address, we take the byte actually that's going to be read, that has been read, but I don't care about that. And JavaScript lets you get away without writing it. And then I can say return if adra is exactly equal to three equals for stupid JavaScript reasons, E00. So that would be one way of writing this. Um, there's a shortcut convenience way of writing small inline functions, which I'm going to actually use because it's a bit easier for brevity. And that's using this kind of equals less than, which means this is a function that takes an address and returns whether or not address is exactly equal to E00. So I have added one sort of function to this chain. And obviously I can actually write arbitrarily complicated code there. I could actually just return false to not stop, but log things out or write to, uh, write to the, the console. Um, or I could check both the address and the byte that was read. So, or let me, let me restart. Oh, sorry, we've hit our breakpoint on FFEE, which I'll stop. And then I'm going to continue and I'm gonna just reset the beep. Oh, of course, nothing ever works the first time. Oh, I've done control 12, sorry, excuse me. Uh, please break, there you go, all right. Um, I've managed to unfortunately zoom in, and I'm gonna zoom back out again. Oh dear, never do things live. There we go, okay, now I can continue going. Right, so we still have that breakpoint set on E is e zero zero, so I'm gonna do print whatever is at E zero zero in basic, and indeed we've hit that read point. So that's useful. That would be like if you have uh, an issue in your code where you're like, I don't know how on earth E00 is getting splatted over. Oh, someone said, just said that you had to reduce the zoom ratio to view what I'm typing. Sorry, I, I did try my best to make everything fit, but uh, if there's a compromise between the screen size and readability and the ability to get all the stuff on screen. So yeah, if you were interested in trying to work out why on earth a particular memory address was being splatted, or if you're debugging a game and you're trying to say, when, where is it writing to FE00 to, to program the, the video chip, you would maybe put a, a breakpoint of this nature on, um, on conditional on the address, maybe on the value that's being read. Um, similarly, I could have done processor.debug write here and um, seen where uh, writes were happening. So that's, that was a very powerful and useful um, facility when I was debugging JSB itself. But oftentimes it's kind of too late by the time you've gotten to this point. Like if for whatever reason we were like saying, I was really interested in working out why we were reading from E00. And that would mean I'd need to know the history of how on earth we got to the point where we read from E00. And that's where the dump trace comes in because when you are in this kind of mode where you have breakpoints set, JSB is running slower than normal and it is in fact keeping a ring buffer of the last 256 instructions that it's processed. And so we can get to see what it had been doing up to this point. And so if we look back up this list of, of things here, these, this, these three things here are the uh, A, X and Y register at the point the instruction was run. So uh, you can see here, um, like on the on AE7D here, we had uh, uh, A register of OD, but the TXA put the FF into the A register and so on. And this is the address of the instruction. This is the disassembly of that instruction and so on. So that's a really, really invaluable way of working out how on earth a memory splat happened. And I think I used this one um, to, um, uh, to, to find some really interesting um, bugs that were actually turned out, one, one thing turned out to be a bug, bug in, I, I believe Tom Seddon's master demo, where um, there was a sort of, there was a one cycle window where the ROM, um, bank was not necessarily right during an interrupt handler. And I could obviously, I with JSP being... Me. Oh, hello? Sorry? Yes, me, Sarah Walker. Oh, it was you, Sarah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. Sorry, yes, sorry, sorry, Sarah, yes. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, yeah, the, um, yeah, there was a one cycle window where I think um, we were just tickling it every time because of the exact setup of, um, of, of how things were, um, were, were organized. So um, yeah, that, I think that would, this, this allowed me to find what was, uh, what was going on and we could like look back and go and go, oh, look, this thing has just switched ROM banks. I don't think it meant to. I don't, it's very vague in my mind now. So um, yeah, and then obviously there's a, um, we can do a debug instruction here. And so you can add events to the instruction handler. And um, that obviously one thing to do would be to have like a conditional breakpoint where you're like, okay, if this particular type of, um, sorry, if this address is read from, sorry, if an, inst an instruction at this address is being read from, I want to stop. That is incidentally how these breakpoints are working. When I click in these margins here behind the scenes, it is just using the same system to add a, um, a breakpoint. 
in the same way using a, like a little function. But in my little crib sheet over here, I'm going to steal something. First of all, um, JS, the JavaScript doesn't have good manipulation of strings. So I've got some utility package here that I can pull in. And now I've got like a hex byte and hex word, which is just convenience. And then I'm going to write the world's most rubbish CPU profiler. And by write, I mean paste in from the, the notes that I've got over here. So I'm going to take the top 12 bits of every uh, address. Um, so I'm going to ignore four bits. This is what the adder bits is for. I'm going to have a histogram, which is going to be an array of, of, of 4,096 zeros, one for each 16 byte block of the corresponding address. And then instead of um, returning true at any time on my, my debug trace, I'm going to add a little thing that says, given an address, increment the counter at the address shifted down by that adder bit. So we're going to you know, pick the top 12 bits only of the address because I want to like group. This is a poor man's you know, like a sampling profiler. And if I run that and then I hit go over here and then let's go and you know, run. Oh, and I've still got my E00 breakpoint on as well. Let me just turn that off. One thing we can do, processor.debugread.clear, which gets rid of all of those breakpoints. Oh, and I've still got the stupid noises on, which you can't hear, but I'm suffering. <laughs> I will talk about how to turn those off in a second. Um, we run it a little bit. Oh, that, that's probably enough for me to get my point across. So I'm just going to deliberately stop it with control. So that's me deliberately pressing the key presses to go into the debugger. But now um, I can, with another crib sheet here, I'm going to go over that 4,096 um, uh, array of histograms. I'm going to map it to be something a bit more useful, sort them, and then pick the top 10. And so what we'll find is 8CD0 is apparently where it spent most of its time. I bet you that's why it was idling in basic while I was still faffing and talking to you. But this is an interesting way. I mean, this is, I'm just trying to find some ways of, of, of showing the other things you can do. Um, I did, for example, use this to get a, a histogram of the op codes while I was running Exile and while I was running Elite. And that kind of gave me a hint as to which op codes were actually worth spending more time looking to, to optimize or, or not to make the emulator run faster. Uh, yes, so, and, and other people who have approached me about their emulators and trying to get them to be cycle perfect it's relatively straightforward to add a, um, a little hook that says, you know, within, if the program counter is within this range, then print out everything I can possibly find. I'll print out how many cycles have ever elapsed, print out the A, the X, the Y register, you know, all, all the things. And then that way you can do, get them to do the same in their emulator. And then side by side, you can um, try and work out where you start to deviate from someone else's code. So that's really invaluable. And I think probably those of you writing games might find those things useful. I appreciate that all of the emulators have some level of, of, um, of debugger built into them. Um, this one obviously has the full power of JavaScript if you want to write something really complicated and to say, no, I only want to know the 400th time this happens when the moon is in the ascendant, all that kind of stuff. Okay, is that, uh, I think that's all the things that I had on my list for showing off uh, JSB. So I am going to pop that back over to here and then my notes here that you'll see. So yeah, full screen printer. Oh, speedy mode. Um, if you hit control insert, um, it takes off this frame lock. And unfortunately we don't run at the same kind of speed as, as scary beasts, uh, be jit, which is super, super cool. Um, we're, I think you can run it on this laptop. It runs about eight, eight megahertz is the full speed it'll go, but it's certainly good for getting through like long loading bits and pieces. Uh, debugging, we talked about registers, breakpoints, um, watch points, and the debug trace, uh, which is called dump trace. Actually, I should really prepend it with debug. Now I've just said to you that debug is the thing that you should be looking for. And yeah, you can um, go around in the debugger um, with the various keys that I talked about some of them. Uh, the URLs, again, if you bring up that um, disk panel, you can share a URL that already has some of these in it. But one of the cool things that I, I quite like is that you can actually load a basic by um, a, a URL itself. So over here on GitHub, if I wake this page back up, I have um, something I found I must have done a while ago for, for comedy effect. And here's a tiny little basic program which asks you for the nuclear key and then thankfully doesn't launch any missiles at you. What you can do is get the raw, and it's really important you get the raw link here for boring web reasons. And if I grab this, I can now go to BBC 
of org query load basic equals that, that URL. And then I can use the ampersand and say auto run, which means it's going to type run afterwards. So I can hit enter, share that URL with whomever. And if I'm lucky and it works, we get into a basic program, which is kind of a neat way, to, especially on Twitter, to share something silly about, you know, like, hey, here's, you know, the, the, those of you who've seen Look Around, you know, the big sort of silly scrolling thing. That's, a, that's an easy thing to send people a tweet with. And of course, there is actually a Twitter bot now that does something not a million miles from, from that. So that's kind of a neat thing to be able to do. Um, auto boot, you can add. Uh, if you add the param no seek there, it shuts the disk drive up. And I need to add some UI for that. So if you've, if you've hated the sound, I, I noticed that uh, BBC Micro Co UK does do this already. Um, that's, uh, that's a decent parameter to add. And um, I also support patching. And this came out from um, a friend of mine on a mailing list. They mocked up a, a, a picture of the elite screen. And instead of the rating being harmless, it was some profanity, actually, I think. And so I, I thought I can go one better. I'm rather than like some terrible Photoshopery, I'm going to share a link which actually boots you into Elite where that is your, actually your status. And it turns out, and I'm sure mo most of you know much more about this than I, that Elite is not straightforward. And so I have a whole blog post here about how I worked out how on earth the, um, the strings were stored, which was good fun and resulted in something amusing, which if we have time, I'll show you at the end. But as a result of that, um, I added this patch facility. So if you can see here in the URL at the top here, I've got this at and then a comma, and then an address and then a patch. What this means is it's going to set a breakpoint at 3.1 AC. And once it hits that point, it will apply the patch, which is itself a comma separate, separated list of address, colon, sequence of hex digits. So if I were to boot up Elite now, if I could remember how to press the right keys, if I wasn't so foolish, drum roll. This is really not worth it. And I should have turned off the disk noise. we get the glory of having the, the one and only rating of being a monkey, which was amusing to me at the time and was not the profanity that my friend shared. So that's the kind of thing you can do uh, with the patch. Uh, obviously, the breakpoint here is useful because you don't want to patch. You, you need to know when to apply the patch. And so you find an obvious place. I think I just ran, ran elite and then stopped it when it was starting to render the old um, spinny ship and thought, well, that's a good as pace as any to, to make the change. So that's kind of cool. And there are quite a lot more um, URL parameters. And if you go to the JSB uh, GitHub page, there's a, a, a list of them. And I, I don't think NoSeq is actually on there, amusingly. All right. So this is a big reveal now. Drum roll. Um, as anyone who's been using Slack or Discord or any of the sort of native clients that are really just web pages, uh, there is a, a facility where you can take a web page and turn it into a native application. <laughs> Rather confusingly, this facility is called Electron. So I can, I'm glad to announce Electron support in JSB, but it's not what you want, I'm sure. Um, so you can now go and download an XE, a app image, or whatever DMG is for, the, for Mac folks. And it's, uh, it's, where are we? Over here, I'm going to my JSB. I've got it built somewhere just to show you. It's, there's nothing particularly exciting. But for those of you who need to not have it run as a web page, and it will open the door to more things along the way. All right, JSB app image. So I'm on Linux, and look, it's a native app. Honest to goodness, there's you know menus with the load disk stuff, and I can paste, and it actually does do a paste. I think maybe it doesn't. I maybe have to fix that. This was all hacked together while I was doing this presentation. I went, hang on a second, I really wanted to do this for a while. So. Go ahead, knock yourself out. Imagine, I'd imagine that I'll spend some more time making this a little bit more native-like than it currently is. But um, uh, Electron support, not as you know it though, uh, in JSB. So in the time that I've got remaining, uh, the good, it's the good kind of Electron. <laughs> so uh, it's not, I'm sorry, OX code. I'm don't mean to make you, make you sad. I don't know anything about the Electron. And I know that somebody has already taken the, the, the bones of the um, JSB code and has turned it into a, an Electron emulator. I'm really glad. And I love the fact that open source lets this, this, this happen. So um, here we are. Um, I'm, this is the sort of stage of the talk where I'm going to go into a little bit about how it works behind the scenes. 
I apologize if this is teaching you things that you already know, but hopefully there's just enough stuff in here that's interesting to, to keep uh, us going. And I've got to keep an eye on the time. So we all know what X, uh, sorry, X86, you should, most of the time when I'm talking about assembly, it is X86 assembly. You know what 6502 assembly looks like, so I'm not gonna go over this. Um, all those instructions, as we probably know, boil down to sequences of bytes. So load A with 20 is A920 in memory, and that's what the CPU reads and it interprets and understands to know what it is it should be doing. They get sort of very complicated, and the pseudocode for uh, load A with paren 70 comma Y is actually reasonably involved, and that's pretty awesome for a, 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 an 8-bit machine. Um, but we all know that. So again, I don't have to justify to you. So how do you emulate a 6502? Um, it's really just like a CPU would do it. You fetch an instruction, you decode it, and you execute it. And so this is the bones of what any emulator will look like. You have a variable that keeps the various register values, including the program counter here. You have a forever loop, which is gonna be like, this is while, ever, while the machine is still powered up and running, you're going to read from memory, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second, from wherever the program counter is, and you're gonna say, well, what is that byte? This is the decode step. And then each of these case statements is gonna be essentially the execute for that instruction. So our load A with immediate, we know that the very next byte is the value that we want to load into the accumulator. And really it's as simple as saying, well, okay, let's put that into the A register, and then now we're done. And this PC++ means it's gonna increment the pip load program counter so that we're gonna look at the next instruction next time. And so you do load A immediate, you do load A address, and then you kind of put the manuals in your lap and you sit down, and write them out, you know, case all the different possible permutations and combinations, which is cool. Oh, I've, I have got highlights for this. I forget what I've got here. Except, you know, I've glossed over pretty much everything. And the wonderful thing about emulators, though, is that you can get an awful lot out with relatively little code. Um, I, I remember, actually, um, I did a live stream with a friend, um, some C++ stuff, and I hacked together in Python a 6502 emulator, and it took only about 40 to 50 lines of, of relatively t dense, admittedly, Python code to get the operating system like running enough instructions to show that this, there was there was a, a, a the beginnings of a beeb there. And I remember the, one of the first sort of milestones in JS Beeb's life was me just literally dumping 7C00 through the end of um, a 7FFF as ASCII because that's near enough what the mode seven screen is. And I could see BBC, you know, 32K and all the good stuff. And that was just a huge, um, like plus one and two. I, I don't really need very much. I just need an, an, enough to make the operating system think it's plugged into a beam. It's very sort of metaphysical, very deep. Um, but there are some things that we do definitely need to do. So one thing obviously is a processor um, flags. Um, so some of those instructions need to update the processor flags. Like this zero bit and the negative bit, um, carry, overflow, and then some of the other sort of more, slightly more esoteric things that go on. So, you know, now our load A immediate looks a little bit more complicated. We read the value in and then we say, well, it's zero if A was anything other than zero. And then because JavaScript uh, doesn't have any types, but I want them to be as typey as possible, this terrible not not, which is what that two exclamation points is, is coercing A, which is a value and an integer number, not whether a was true or false it's dreadful and these, these are the kind of things i had to do to make it run fast way back when i mean it's been say six years ago was this was an important thing to do in um modern browsers to be able to get them to run fast enough nowadays they're they're pretty smart and similarly here you know we're negative appropriately as well and then I gloss completely over this memory. I just said, hey, there's a function called read mem that's gonna return whatever's at memory addresses. And you know, as discussed, most of you have this committed to memory, so I don't really need to talk about it, but you know, our 32K of RAM lives at the bottom. We have 16K of pageable ROM, and then the operating system is at the top. So that those don't really go to um, the, the operating system ROM chip, they go to various devices on the, uh, on the bus. So our code for reading from memory looks something like this. Now we're going to use this, this script 
when they added open G array of, of 32K of uint eights as an unsigned eight bit integers, we need to know where, which ROM we've got paged in. We load the operating system, we load basic into ROM 15, and now ROM read mem is just a simple sequence of ifs to make sure where are we in that memory map? What, where, which of these arrays do I need to be looking in? And the one sort of tricky one here is, and I will punt on this one for the purposes of this talk, is that you know if it's in one of those two 256 byte windows of, of a hardware, then we need to do something cleverer and something special. And that does lead down a very deep rabbit hole. Otherwise, you know, this must be an operating system address in this particular example. And write mem is even simpler, except for the write hardware, because if you write to RAM, you just put it in the RAM, and anything else is ROM, nothing happens. But, you know, again, I've glossed over this read HW and write HW, and there are more than just a 6502 in here. We have the video chips, all of them, that I, um, I won't go into because there are at least three people that I've seen today who know more than this than I, the sound chip similarly, and the, this, the VIA, the timers. And so, you know, you kind of write those things together. And so putting it together could look something like this. You know, I run a 60th of a second's worth of instructions, you know, two megahertz divided by a 60th of a second. And then I paint the screen. And if you were to do that, and that's pretty simple and straightforward. If you were to do that, you end up with something which looks like this. Oh, I did remember to remove the, um, the disk drive seek, so it sounds like I need some tea, excuse me. And the eagle-eyed amongst you who are already rolling their eyes because they knew that I was doing something deliberately bad, you can start to see the problem with that. And that is we have essentially treated all of these peripherals as totally independent from each other, and we've run them independently, and it's convenient to think of the world that way, but that's not really how it happens. The CPU and the video chip and the timers and the sound chip are running at the same time, cycle by cycle, side by side. And in the way that I've just described the emulator working, that is not what was happening. So you can see here where Elite has its famous split screen mode between the um, high resolution low color and the um, lower resolution high color, if I get that the right way around, that now the interrupt that was switching between modes is not synchronized in any meaningful way. So obviously we can't do that, but how do we fix it? Oh, I described that, that's fine. Uh, so now, rather than the CPU running in a vacuum by itself, we, um, we want to uh, emulate our instruction, and then we know that two cycles of time have passed. So we're gonna tell the video chip it should run for two cycles and do whatever it would normally do in those two cycles. In this instance, it will generate 16 pixels worth of, of data. And then we tell the timers, hey, you need to run for two cycles and do whatever it is. Probably nothing, but you're probably just counting down something and then maybe setting an interrupt if, if needs be. So now, unfortunately, all, all of our instructions are starting to get a little bit more complicated than just they used to be, but that's, that's fine. And if we go, oh, I've done all this, yeah. And now, obviously, it works a treat, and I don't, probably don't have to go through, you know what Elite looks like. So that's, that's cool, I won't, I won't go into that. Um, the best thing about writing an emulator is that once you've got a few things working, suddenly tons of things start working. So you want to start loading up your favorite games. And one of my favorite games, and I'm sure yours, is, is Zaliga. And this is one that Rich DW and I used to play in his bedroom in, in Horsley, West Horsley. Oh. And so, you know, just bear with me a second. You can't hear the music, but you know how lovely it is. Whoops, but I don't know if I press the wrong key on my keyboard, you get to, ah. And then exactly this kind of stuff starts happening. This is sort of motivates writing a somewhat decent uh, debugger. And in fact, if I'm really lucky, this happens about one in three times that I do this, I'm gonna break it. Yes! So if you can see over here, something funky is going on. We're loading AF comma X, and then we hit question mark, question mark, question mark, opcode eight, seven. Well, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. And of course, I'm sure I don't need to tell you what's going on here. Um, Orlando is using the crazy undefined opcodes. And so I'm gonna take a, a five minute detour to kind of explain a little bit on um, uh, about how that came about and how, why they're important and, and, and interesting. And, it's in, and it, this is sort of my, my other sort of hobby passion is to know exactly how these CPUs fit together and how they were designed and how they work. And that's carried me through my, my career. So inside the 6502, we can see um, that 
These are the opcodes around that 87 that was a big question mark. We've got store Y, we've got store A, and we've got store X. And you can see that the only difference between these opcodes, this is the uh, representation in binary of those opcodes, is the bottom two bits of the opcode. So one might reasonably imagine that the, 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 the store instruction is basically the same for all of these uh, instructions. It's just that these two bits control some aspect of what is being stored. And if we look at the actual um, picture here of, of a 6502, um, you'll see that this, this top area here, this marked instruction decode, is essentially a big ROM, a big lookup table that determines which parts of the chip are active at what sub-cycle of an instruction. And it just so turns out, if you follow it through, and this is my terrible ASCII art version, so laughter um, is welcome. I, I won't be able to see or hear it, but I know that you're ch chuckling at this, is that inside the decode logic, all the things that happen for a store are looking at these top few bits of the opcode. That one zero 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 one means a store is gonna happen. So on the zero cycle, a store to zero page. So on the first cycle, we're gonna read which zero page that we, location we want to write to. And then on the, the next cycle, we're going to write the value of whether it's A, X, or Y. Now that ROM is not totally complete. There was no need to wire all possible permutations and combinations because some of them were just invalid and you were told not to use them. But pragmatically what's happening is that the S and T here, which I'm using to delineate those bottom two bits of the opcode, go into something which checks for not S and not T. And if that is true, the Y register is, is allowed to write to the bus, which means that whatever store is happening will pick up the, the Y value. So S and T both being zero means that the Y register will be output on the bus. A just looks at the T. So if T is true, then A will be splattered onto the bus and therefore written out to memory. And similarly, uh, if S is set, then, 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 uh, then the X register will be put on the bus. With the opcode 87 that Orlando's using, what do you think is gonna happen? There's, unlike in a regular um, program where you would probably take the time and effort to check that for T that uh, S wasn't set and S that T wasn't set, all that happens is both of those parts of the circuit are turned on at the same time. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And that means that both A... <coughs> are we good? Yes, good. Um, both A and X are output to the bus at the same time. Now, as a side effect of the way that NMOS works, <coughs> the zero bits win out. So if a one bit is being output and a zero bit is being output, then the zero bit drains the one and so effectively what happens is that A anded with X is written out to the memory. And so this is the SAX instruction. Oh, thank you. My wife has just handed me some water. <laughs> it's very kind of her. Ah, excuse me. Right. So store, store Y, store A, store X. And then this is store A anded with X. And it only occurred to, to me while um, Sarah was giving her presentation that this is a really useful thing to do. If you could guarantee that uh, the X was OF for the mask, this could be a useful thing to, to have um, um, in some of those sprite routines. And that may be why Orlando used it. And maybe that's some, uh, someone who knows more can tell me at the end of this when we're getting there. So we're getting close to, to time and I, I want to make sure that I don't go over to keep us back on track. But... Um, as I added more and more games to the list of uh, things, I've got an, an admission to make. <clears throat> so in, gosh, I must've been 15, uh, Rich TW and I, again in his bedroom, we were right at, trying to um, fix Alien 8 uh, to work on disc. We had a tape version of it and we wanted it to work on disc. We wanted, you know, for, for totally legal backup reasons. And I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and, those of you who've looked at Alienate know that it's got quite a convoluted protection system on it. And Richard and I wanted to remove that so that we could easily put it on, on disc. And we never were able to, it was so complicated. It was so involved. And, and I think probably if uh, he'll correct me if I've got this wrong, the very first emulator that either of us wrote was in BBC basic. And it was a 6502 emulator. And we were trying to emulate the decrypt code of Alien 8. And we failed spectacularly. And only now, 30 years on later, I understand why and how hard it was. Oh, someone's just told me. Thank you, Sarah. Orlando uses SAX when flipping sprites. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll, I'm not smart enough to not understand that on the fly, but I, I trust you completely. Okay, so protection systems, we all know, you know, essentially you, you encrypt the game code and you put the decryptor immediately abutting the game code so that when you start running the decryptor, it just flows naturally into the game and there's no opportunity to, to stop it. And obviously, if, you, if one was able to modify the decrypt code to just put like an RTS at the end of it, then you could stop it before it started running the game. But numbers of tricks, you know, would be, would be used. You know, partly, um, you know, the decrypt key would be things you've read off disk. Often it's the decryption code itself. So that means if you mutate the de decryption code to stop actually decrypting, then you change the key that decrypts the game. Uh, you use hardware timers and registers so that as time is passing, the key is changing, which means if you're breakpointing things or doing any kind of trickery to, to stop uh, the code, then um, you're out of luck because the time is still passing. And then you can actually use things like interrupt information, which is what uh, Kevin Edwards uses in, in, this, uh, in, in the worst sort of forms of his, his uh, production. I think he deliberately breaks uh, the, he deliberately like increments values inside the interrupt handler that then have an effect on the key which is bonkers. And then there's this read, modify, write thing where there's an instruction which you were rotating a piece of memory and that involves a read, a modify, and then a write. And the piece of memory is a piece of hardware. And so there's all these crazy side effects. And that meant that um, we needed to be even more accurate. So with the instructions that I was showing you before where effectively the instruction body runs and then we say, and now time passed, that wasn't good enough anymore because the cycle within the instruction that the read happens is important and the, when the, the cycle where the write happens is important because these things have influences on say the timers visual 6502 i'm sure you all know about i think ed is on on the line so yes on the line sorry listen to me um awesome awesome resource resource was super helpful in working out where things happened and at what time and it allowed me to look at something like this rotate instruction which has uh six cycles counting from zero as all good programmers would do. And on the, uh, um, so the first thing we do is read the opcode, read the two addresses of the address, and then we're gonna read the memory. The rotate takes a cycle and then the store happens. Unfortunately, the 6502 doesn't have a pin that says it doesn't care about talking to memory this cycle. So every cycle, regardless of whether you want to or not, you are reading or writing from memory. And that's usually fine but not if, for example, that memory is actually a hardware, a piece of hardware, in which case reading and writing that piece of hardware has side effects. So surprisingly, what happens on this fourth cycle where we don't want to talk to memory is that, and again, thanks to 60, Visual 6502, I can see that the write pin has gone high and the address line is FE48. And what's actually happening is the, the bus still has the unmodified value of the value that it read in on cycle three here. And unless you emulate that, things like Kevin Edwards protection systems don't work. So that was a really fun thing to find. And then of course, oh, so now, now this is now unfortunately what our, our instructions start looking like from that lovely like platonic ideal I started with. We are um, uh, running two cycles, or sorry, three cycles here to account for the fact that we've read the instruction byte and then we've read the two operand bytes. Then we read the byte, and then we say, well, now one more cycle has passed. Then we write it back again, even though that should have no normal side effects whatsoever. And then we run the hardware again. And then we do the actual work. And then finally, we write back the modified value. So it's a lot more complicated. And although I'm showing you as if I wrote this out longhand, I, I didn't. Uh, most of this stuff is actually code generated from the D, uh, disassembly tables and a few annotations. And there's some optimizations within JSP. But essentially, it's JIT compiling the JavaScript that makes the, each instruction like run as optimally as possible. And then obviously I then eval that in JavaScript to make the actual function. And then behind the scenes, the JavaScript engine, JIT compiles that to x86 or whatever you're running on, which is kind of a long way from the low level of the 6502, which I, I actually find quite fun. And of course, I've totally glossed over things like cycle stretching, which was the, the final piece of the puzzle that allowed and uh, Richard basically worked this, this, this last line out with a very complicated spreadsheet and um, some, some um, I think Ed, I think probably wrote, ran a, a program or two on his a real BBC. We were able to work out exactly the rules about which cycles happen when and what stretches happen. And so as a result of that, we were, I was finally able to decode 
um, and run alienate without any kind of kludgy hacks anywhere in the code. It just kind of works from mostly from first principles. And that was an exciting moment. Uh, so just as a, a, a final point here, um, I was, I was lucky enough to get in contact with Ian Bell while I was, um, early on in, in the development of JSB and, um, he gave me the permission to put elite, um, into the repository, which is one of the reasons why it's the default image. And then having done that silly hack with the patch to let the, uh, me overwrite what the, the, the harmless with monkey or whatever, uh, I emailed him and said, Hey, I've done this blog post. I've reverse engineered how your, um, your, your, your format worked. And he's like, oh, oh, I've got something for you. And he sent me this. And this is a scan from uh, his dot matrix printout of one of the original pieces of paper that they used, he and um, Braben used when they were writing that string routine. And it's just lovely. And the, the, I think the file name, have I got it here? Uh, it's, it's got a file name. And the file name happens to be the, the file name of the routine, as you can see in the source code of, of, of Elite that's out there. So this was a really magical moment for me to sort of see uh, connect with one of my heroes and hit them send me something pretty pretty awesome so that's that so I, i'm going to finish up with just putting these resources on the screen i have to say huge thanks to chris evans rich Tor Watkins, and kieran for for their help on this and of course sarah's emulator was was absolutely instrumental in having a sane reference point to start from and in fact those who've looked at the jsb source code will see that there are some very close similes in some of the less um, well-traveled areas of the emulator. Uh, Ed, thank you for, for that, uh, the 6502 stuff. And obviously thanks to Ian Bell, Kevin Edwards, who allowed me to actually write um, a unit test. So one of the unit tests inside JSB is to be, can we still decode uh, ultimate play the game go games? Um, and thanks obviously to the Stardot folks. So with that, I think I'm about on time. And if there's, if there is any flexibility in the schedule, I'd be delighted to take questions. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, I will hand back to to uh, Arcadian and Co. Thanks, Matt. All right, I'm gonna. And I would be interested in any feedback on the um, the nat native. Thing it's a new thing for me, and it's and it's actually a terrible scourge in our in our life that we are now sort of in the full inception of running native apps that themselves are embedding entire websites that then JIT compile from some dreadful language into uh, um, x86 to to then show you like essentially you know a, a chat program it's dreadful but I'm and I'm contributing to it but <laughs> it seemed like a fun thing to do. So thank you all. I've got a quick one, Matt. Um, when you were doing this, uh, you say you started this sort of seven or eight years ago. How much faster now? And how much have you sort of um, soaked up that fastness with new features? Has it become over those sort of six years? It's re stayed remarkably consistent. I have got some benchmarks that I run from time to time and they've stayed pretty on the ball. Uh, I've mostly taken out the sort of browser special tricks that I used to do. So I used to detect which browser you were on and I knew that um, Firefox, for example, was it was much better to use this way to dis dispatch. Like, like obviously I've completely glossed over a lot of the details here, that's the fun part. So if you just write a switch statement with 256 um, entries in it, uh, Firefox was great. Chrome de-opted the whole thing. It was like, hey, this is just too big. It's not worth JIT compiling this. I'm like, no, no, it really is worth JIT compiling this. Just, and so it, it ran at terrible speed. So there was a whole bunch of hacks that detected which was what was going on. Um, and I filed a number of bugs with both Chrome and Firefox. Excuse me. And they fixed pretty much everything now. So I've taken out most of the special Casey hacks and I actually have some great Firefox swag they sent me for filing all these performance issues. It's really cool. Um, uh, so... I haven't had to spend too much time optimizing it. I will be honest that adding the uh, debug logging stuff, or sorry, rather, taking that out, having a special version of the main loop that said, like, if none of the breakpoints are set, and if the um, no one's watching anything, and there's no good things, then then call the version of the main loop that doesn't even have the checks in it. Now, in theory, JIT compilers should be able to work that out for themselves, but it, it's useful to give it a big hint. That made a big difference in terms of the performance, but. Realistically speaking, most of the things that I've added in haven't added any main, uh, a major um, disadvantage. And how much headroom have you got left? You said, you said if you're sort of um, running at full 
Faltel. What did he get up to? About eight, did he say? Yes. So there's not a giant amount of headroom. You know, like I'm basically twice as fast as I would need, need to be. Uh, a lot of the time is actually spent in the video uh, emulation. The CPU is one thing, but like getting the video right is, is, is tough. Uh, I think if I, we were to do it again, and I think, you know, again, Scary Beast is around as well. He's, the, the, there could be some clever way of, I don't know, serializing to another thread. Now we can do threads in JavaScript, which is, of course, frightening. Um, using more, more of the OpenGL acceleration to do some of the trickery. That, that we're doing in, in plain software. I mean, I have got one thing that uses OpenGL to, to turn from like a Java native, a convenient for BBC Java native, JavaScript native thing into the actual pixels you see on the screen. Uh, so uh, it's not that much headroom. I think that's a fair, fair point. Cool. I've, I've been trying to get, um, I'm doing the Blitz thing and I'm trying to get that running parallel with the rest of the graphics. And that's Neat. got three processors going at eight megahertz. And I can just about squeeze it into BM. I'm wondering whether I might have a go at JSB as another that option. Would be, that would be fun. I mean, you might find that it's okay, depending on how complicated the Blitzer things are. And they're, not, also, they're not too bad, actually, but they've got to, they, you've got to have the CPU socket going, updating the hardware every tick, because the Blitzer is probably going to poke a pixel at the screen in that tick. Got and it. it's probably going to tickle some hardware every tick. So of course, are you, so you actually doing like the Amiga style thing where you poke, the, get the blitter to poke the hardware. Yeah. Oh man, that's amazing and awesome, but also terrifying for <laughs> for emulator yeah. writers because that's like oh sugar. No, it's, it's dead easy in the F, FPGA, but actually getting it to work in an emulator at speed is like oh I shouldn't have done this. I know that's brilliant. I mean, and, and especially like with things like BJIT and stuff, or even just like a, a, even just using a compiled language. I mean, for God's sake, this, this is a supercomputer by anyone's stretch of the imagination over here. That is so I'm pointing my laptop. Uh, you know, we've got plenty. We should have plenty of time. It's ludicrous to even do do it in in JavaScript and then hope that somehow the twenty eight layers between you and the microcode of the computer, the the, the, the CPU that you're running on, actually doing the work is is, yeah. is fast enough. That's an interesting one. Um, so one thing I have experimented with, and the reason I did the live stream with a pal was we were thinking um, like, uh, and this is sort of links us back to Sarah's talk about the um, the, the the little invader th patterns, the, the waveform waveform, the um, enemy behavior is using coroutines, which is you know Knuth's name for the posh routines that call each other and one returns from one thing to the other and all that kind of nonsense. So. Um, with, in that world, you could actually write the almost boring straight line code of the CPU that's like, okay, tick once, do the other thing, do the other thing. And then the CPU is not special. At the moment, the CPU is special because it's the source of time as we move forward. Like, you know, I'm the CPU, I did one instruction, therefore I tell everyone else they should move one instruction forward. And that makes it very awkward. But if you if you essentially just have a yield, exactly like Sarah was doing with the JSR to like run the baddies for a bit, and then when it returns back, some time has passed and everyone else has had their go, then um, it, it becomes an easier way to write lots of little snippets of code. And then, you know, you're, you're um, um, and, and maybe, and, and the reason I've brought this up is that the, the C++ um, um, committee have voted in coroutines as like a thing that's going to happen in the C++20. So there may be some compiler support in there in, in, the, in that world. So maybe that'll help. But I mean, ultimately, you just got to do the work, right? And if you're programming, po poking the, um, the video chip on every other frame or, or sorry, every other cycle, then, you're in, you have to simulate it that way. With the sound chip, I get away with like a cheat where um, effectively I, re I keep a, a tab of the last time you poked any of the registers for the, the sound chip and then I don't really run it until either I need some audio, in which case I go back in time and go, well, what were the settings at this point? Okay, play it forward. Or you change one of them, in which case it goes, okay, this much time's passed, fill in with the old settings and now remember this new part as the thing. So you get the, the benefit of like a sort of um, a big chunk of work to do. I'm sure all the other emulators do that too. Any other questions out there? What are your um, what I'm interested? What are your plans for JSB next? If you, how can you? I mean, you can make it faster, or but what? Yeah. Uh, good question. I mean, in in preparing for this, I it was kind kind of clear that there's not really any UI for a lot of the things that I use like all that stuff I showed with the, J the JavaScript panel, there's, there's a world in which some of those things are at least are exposed through the UI. So you can do some debugging and whatever. I'd kind of like to be able to put, and I realized my um, 
miracle the Sega Master System emulator has this feature, and I can't believe I didn't bring it across. You could tag addresses and like don't you know where the address was in the um, um, the disassembly view. You could click and then you could type a name, and that way it would be replaced with that name. And I know that other emulators um, support that kind of thing, and I think you can even export that. So loading that in would be a cool thing to be able to do. I mean, I'm not blessed with an enormous amount of time. I know we all talk about this, and none of us have. Uh, my other hobby project keeps me busy all the time, but um, I would like to get back to it. I think I'd like to actually write something that ran on it as opposed to adding things to the, to, to the emulator itself. But certainly um, maybe fleshing out a little bit more of the, of the app version would be worthwhile. Surfacing some of the debug features that are already in there would be cool. Uh, NULA support would be nice. Uh, that's that I'd like to do that if only just to learn what cool things can be done with the NULA. Um, I don't think I've ever said it out loud before. How do you say that? Is it NULA or NULA? Who do, who do someone chime in and tell me how foolish I sound? Do you think it could be used to, uh, do you think you could simulate any other hardware on it at all? Not BBC hardware or? There's no reason why not. And especially the more esoteric the hardware, the less like, with the exception of blitter chips. The, the more esoteric the hardware, the less likely you need to be really cycle accurate. So um, certainly the, like it, it does work with a, you can have a tube processor and I can fire up another one. And I, could, I could add an arm or whatever in, on that, but I would involve writing one, which is I'm too lazy to do. Uh, so I think other hardware could be supported. And, and um, I've got a long outstanding, there's a, there's a chap who, who um, uh, uses uh, BBC, or had used BBC, uh, BBC Micro with people that have learning disabilities or physical disabilities. And so he had all of the, like, the peripherals for, for pressing the buttons and things. And so I started putting in things to allow them to rerun those things. Cause you know, that's an awesome thing to be able to do is like, you know, this is what we did 30 years ago for everyone, right? <laughs> regardless of uh, ability. So that's, that's another thing that I'd probably do a bunch of um, uh, switch support and touchscreen support. I was thinking of like AMX mouse or something. Or yeah, I think, the, I, think the I mentioned that to you once. I was the person. Yeah. Yes. Because I've got an iPad, you see. I know iPads, blah, blah. But um, yeah, I was thinking, oh man, this, this could be possible here. On the, iPad, the biggest but... issue with those things is the, 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 the disconnect between the way that the AMX mouse works is it's delta base from where it last was. And um, obviously a touch screen is just it teleports around and trying to synchronize where the, you know, as the hardware pretending to be the hardware, you can't tell wh where it is that there's, you know, like the mouse doesn't know where it is. It just knows how much it moves since the last time. So trying to square the circle of that. And if anyone's got some smart ideas about how one could do that, otherwise you'd be forever drawing and the mouse pointer will be away from where your finger is. And that would be irritating. I see. Yeah. Yeah, there's no sort of centering operation or scaling even to say like, well, okay, if I move my finger one inch across here, it moves 300 pixels in iPad space. And how far should that be? That one's pretty easy to do, actually. You could probably work out what that is. Yeah, or even a music 5000. <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone's saying the VMware is just as bad over there. It's right, the electron thing, wrong yeah. by adding the electron as another machine variant. That, that could, we could potentially, uh, that could happen. But I'm no expert in electron stuff. Uh, the electron was just something a friend of mine had. We'd go around to their house and she would play Repton. That was that was what we did on the electron. <laughs> where, where are you with joysticks now, Matt? Oh, good question. At one stage, somebody said, submitted a whole bunch of patches to make it work with like an Xbox controller. And I have no reason to think that that's broken. Um, but I think that's more like pressing the keys with an Xbox controller than it is supporting like an analog, um, you know, the good old fashioned. Yeah. Uh, ice cream cone type joystick. Uh, so yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but that would be a good one to, to do. Although I don't know what you would emulate it with on like this side, maybe the mouse. Yeah. Well, or paddle as well. Work with a mouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. The, the, the paddles probably work better than like a touchscreen type thing. And obviously people ask for like it working on an iPad in any way that's not totally dreadful. And um, that involves right, actually writing a virtual keyboard, unfortunately, because a lot of those things have got, um, uh, a keyboard, but I'm trapping the key down and key up events and they're mapping to physical hardware. So it's not like I can accept, you know, 
various chord presses that you press on that unless they I, the, I know that you press shift and then you press break and the, the shift is still down when you press break uh, most of the keyboard interfaces I've seen don't work that way you know they're like you press the a key I'm like yeah I know but are you still holding it down <laughs> It's an amazing thing, JSP, by the way. Uh, oh, thank you. As I say, I feel, I always feel, this is, this is a story of all my, my hobby projects, is they're always, so I feel very fraudulent because they're always built on someone else's clever idea. <laughs> well, I always so say, thank God we've got people like you. No? <laughs> thank you very much. That's very sweet. For the mouse thing, you could add a rectangle on screen and scale the movement within that. Yeah, it's, I mean, the scaling is one thing. It's like the centering aspect of it. You know, obviously the mouse pointer yeah. is something that the software knows where it is. Only the software and, and it's individual for each piece of software. Like you fire up AMX Paint or whatever and the mouse pointer is in the center of the screen. And yeah. you have to know that so that when somebody presses over here, oh, you can't see where I'm pressing, mm -hmm. presses over here, that actually you need to turn that into a jump of 50 pixels to the right. Yeah. Otherwise it's like, okay, well, you're started there. Now as you drag it around, it's like, well, I'm moving from the center. And of course you can probably account for that in some way but i haven't i'm not clever enough to think of a way of reason a, a way of for a mouse you could probably hack the two or three programs that use it <laughs> <laughs> so you know where it is that's true that's very true have you have you seen the the oh i can't forget i forget his name there's a there's a, a rather bonkers chap who has done like a th 3d versions of nes games including like zelda and stuff and he has this automatic process for determining where the player character is by like saving emulator state running forward and backwards and seeing which memory values work and then it's like well that must be where the character is and it's like totally automated it's crazy i guess loading and saving would be a useful thing to be able to do that's one thing i keep punting on because web web browsers in general don't like you storing giant gobs of information uh and so like storing for a master you know all, all 128k of memory uh as a string as it would have to be uh, is not very enticing. Although 128K is nothing these days, is it? So it doesn't sound it's a so very sad. big job now. I know. Does anyone, I mean, anyone else who works like in right, compiled programs now, do you shudder inside when you do, I just need a buffer to store some, some like, I don't know, it's a URL. And you do char buff 200, you know, 32, 32768. And you're like, I just blew an entire BBC micro for just a piece of temporary text that's probably no good, not going to be longer than like 12 bytes. What is wrong with me? <laughs> what has happened to my career? How do we get here? Are you adding any more uh, 6502 tool chains to compiler? Oh, uh, I haven't got any plans at the moment, but that's another thing uh, that, yeah, so you can go and actually see <laughs> I mean, tool chains is strong really for, for compi compiler explorer. Uh, for for sixty dollars two because like it's like honestly there's the worst uh, eight bit processor to try and fit C into is terrible idea you know like the Z eighty at least has enough registers to be worthwhile uh, but people wanted it and uh, Jason Turner is uh, if you've not seen his um, C plus plus talk on uh, rich code for tiny computers that's worth an hour of your time where he builds. Uh, like full on all the bells and whistles um, C++ 17 feature based bat and ball game for the Commodore 64 and runs it live on stage, which is just wonderful. <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and it uses a terrible trick. It just takes x86 and transcodes it for the, like the, the dozens of opcodes that actually get emitted for the kind of code he's writing. And I think it's a great pragmatic way of uh, achieving a neat goal. We have that on, on Compiler Explorer. There's also Beebasm, beebasm.godbolt.org, which shows like me trying to square that circle in a different way again, where it's uh, essentially takes um, Rich DW's Beebasm, sorry, Beebide, beebide.godbolt.org, uh, takes uh, Rich's uh, Beebasm, it compiles it from C to WebAssembly, which is like an interpreted version of of the new environment and embeds it and you've got an editor on the left hand side that you can type in your bbasm and as you're typing it's compiling it in javascript on your machine and then it injects it into a an older version of jsb on the right hand side so you've kind of got this whizzy we get it to thing and i was that was just something i knocked out in an, in an afternoon because you know, the obvious thing of like well you run this one website with all the code thing and you run this one thing with all the emulator thing is there one way you can put them together it's it's totally unsupported and there's just a hack i don't even know how it's still up, to be honest. 
I don't know how much time I've got. I can, I can keep talking forever. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally banking on somebody to, uh, who, who's running this to interrupt me. Yeah. If there's a moment, I've got a um, Code Explorer uh, statement for Matt that you might find interesting. Okay. Um, if, uh, if other members on the forum will have heard this. Um, uh, ARM GCC, uh, the GCC ARM backend will generate undefined instructions in the ARM data stream, if you didn't know that. Sorry, I have to unmute myself, don't I? I, I, I didn't know that, actually. And that could be an artifact of the fact that we're not necessarily in step with uh, the GNU tools version and the compiler. And like, the, the, there are over seven, no, there's 600 odd compilers now on Compiler Explorer. And it's a reason that I'm going gray is mainly trying to keep those all up and running and built from, mostly built from source. So um, my, I'm a sort of part-time compiler engineer, it would seem, but not like in a good way. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's almost certainly a mismatch between uh, the GNU tools that it's using and that. But if you if you send me a link or or you know yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it, as far as I can see, um, I was doing some bare metal with connecting my Pi to the Beeb, um, and I cheat to make performance <laughs> good. I move the vectors um, away from zero in memory, um, and so then the C <laughs> compiler I was deliberately writing to zero. Um, and uh, that turns Which is out undefined. To, yeah, it's undefined. so the, the compiler is allowed to do whatever it likes with that. If it's if it detects that you're doing it, it's like I can assume this can't happen. Therefore, I can throw your entire program in the bin and replace it with a picture of a herring, and you know yeah. that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked a warning. <laughs> right. I mean, this there's the, the famous um, Linux kernel bug which the same thing happened it's like hey but we check it afterwards we, we you know we dereference it or we get an address of it here and then we check it and then if it's, it's like no it's too late you were doing something undefined the compiler is allowed to assume which is a pain in the bum but when you take it away the compiler starts emitting dumb code all over the shop which is unfortunate it's kind of a double-edged sword but yeah, yeah that's really interesting i mean if you if you yeah that's a, actually it's a really fascinating thought that that's a valid thing to do i i I'm fairly sure, I'm fairly sure that you're allowed to assume that the null pointer is not zero. It's just that there exists something which is null that is invalid to write to. Oh man, I wish I, I might be on a Slack, I can ask someone. But I wonder if you can tell GD, uh, GDB, GCC, like, hey, my null, it lives over here. It's not zero, it's, it's hex 8000 or, or something. Yeah, I, I couldn't Don't find a way. Uh, so in the end, I, I wasted an extra cycle uh, in my uh, assembler that deals with the other half of the code in the interrupt routine. Uh, <laughs> it's sad. That's a sad when you have to do that, but it's also not totally surprising. I mean, it's lovely that you can write this in a moderately sane language and not in pure assembly anyway, the kind of stuff I'm sure you're doing if you're worrying about that kind of thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But yes, your compiler explorer is very useful. Oh, I'm glad. Thank you. Uh, and and JSB is it has been very useful. It's weird that you're being able to use them together, <laughs> but pleasing, very pleasing. Yes. <laughs>